Hello, my name is Lillian Warren. My current body of work is in a show at Anya Tisch Gallery. The title of the show is Parables in Everyday Stories, and it will be up through October 31st. I'm here with Nancy Wozni, who is Editor-in-Chief of Arts and Culture Texas, a frequent contributor to a wide variety of other magazines, and an avid supporter of the visual and the performing arts in Houston and throughout all of Texas. So Nancy, you've had a chance to see some of these works in person. Um, and you know my work from uh, years past. So what are your thoughts? What are your questions? Well, first of all, Lillian, I want to thank you for inviting me to have this virtual conversation. I really miss our studio visits. Um, I always look forward to seeing what you're up to. And you're always up to something a little different. So when I, uh, the last time I um, was in the studio, you showed me this body of work. And I was, I was quite like astounded by um, what a, I, you know, maybe you don't agree with me, but I find it a big departure from the last. Um, maybe your last show at, um, at Anya. So it was super fun for me to see and um, I'm dying to talk to you about it because it is, um, I feel like it's kind of, dare I say, splashy work. It has, uh, <laughs> it has a little glamour to it and it's not, you know, uh, it's not, it's subdued as, as, um, and quiet and, and um, contemplative as some of your work. So um, you have this amazing thing going on with the Book of Kells and this other body of work of these figures that you have been um, uh, working with for some time. And they're, they're kind of, you know, they're put together and that has this great kind of dynamic quality to it. So why you, I, I really want to understand how, um, how the people met the Book of Kells. Like how did this how do these two things come together? Can you bring us into that moment? Okay, so let me talk about, I guess, the process of creating yeah. a painting. Okay, and yeah. I'm going to use one of the images, which is a tale of risk taking, to to illustrate that and and show the images we talk about. It. Um, so the process for all of the paintings starts off with a collaboration. So it's an improvisational collaboration with volunteers who agree to uh, come to my studio or the gallery and go through gentle improv. I don't make them do anything too embarrassing or hard, uh, but then I capture all these images of people doing things, uh, interacting with um, uh, and engaging with other people. And then, uh, so I move from this collaborative um, stage to uh, appropriation from the Book of Kells, which is one of my favorite references, but then also other sources in medieval manuscripts because there are many traditions. So I appropriate images from there um, and they have these wonderful, um, crazy, uh, flattened, abstracted people and monsters and decorative text. And, and so I, I use those kinds of image from a wide variety of sources. Add to all that some organic abstraction, some pattern and decorations. You've got this really wide um, reference to art history and various movements. And then I try to mix them all together. My, my mixing of that is Photoshop. So it's basically a lot of uh, electronic collage. So then um, the challenge is to create with all these disparate pictorial grammars to create kind of a cohesive, if slightly wonky world where they are in the same space and they seem to be breathing the same air. Um, and that's partly the color, just a, a uniform color scheme throughout. And then also just do the figures interact. So if we're looking at um, uh, tale of risk taking uh, and look at the, the bottom of that particular image and we see this strange lion looking creature with this pleading look on his face telling the guy that's embedded in the armature to be careful. And then if you look up above that, you have another little flattened medieval fellow pulling the tail on another lion who looks extremely annoyed. So those images reinforce the story and the medieval characters interact with the contemporary characters 
And if you look a little bit to the left, there's this big, big swirls of organic abstract um, paint that forms the border, but also forms the body of the dragon. Uh, and I uh, worked to get that you know, organic abstraction so that it both reflected energy, uh, you know, this kind of roiling energy of the dragon, and maybe also the dragon um, uh, scales and such. That, uh, that portion of, of each painting, there's always something in there that is this you know, kind of swirly abstraction. When I do it, at the time, it's very quick and intuitive, but usually it's uh, preceded by maybe hours of practice. It's like what colors, what mix, what viscosities, it's almost like chemistry, you know. Uh, what order do I put them together? How heavy do I use the paint? You know, because if, if you mess with it too much, it turns into mud. And so you've got to practice it and practice it and practice it. And you take a deep breath and you execute. <laughs> you know, Lillian, you're taking all the mystery out of it for me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and when I look at this work, I, you know, it's almost like these characters are living within this, you know, world. Well, that's, that's what I want it to look like. Oh. They, they all live together and they were just born there. And this is, you know, the way it is. Well, so, I mean, I've had the experience of doing the improv um, and, and having my image end up in, you know, other places. And uh, it was really curious to see uh, how, that, how that ended up. Um, how do you know, you know, you have this tremendous body of, um, of material, of a, a vocabulary of characters. Um, how do you know which are going to work in the Book of Kells situation? Like, what were you looking for in, um, in those human interactions that you thought might sort of flow in and out of um, that design scaffold of the Book of Kells? Like, what, what, what quality? Well, I... Um... I'm looking for interesting body language, interest, interesting facial expressions, uh, uh, body language and facial expressions that express a hint of an essential story of some kind. Um, although sometimes I know exactly what that's going to be. So for instance, there's one called a parable of selfies. And that's pretty obvious because I, and I knew that before I did it and that I took pic pictures of people taking selfies. And so I knew what that parable was. This one uh, is tale of risk taking. I had no clue what I was going to call it. I try, I went through a long list of names and kind of lived with them and, and none of them worked, but I, I really loved the interaction of the people and how they seem to be slip sliding around on this medieval jungle gym. It's like, what are they doing? One of the things I like about a tale of risk taking is the, the ambiguity. I can think of at least two interpretations. For instance, it could be a tale of ordinary people taking extraordinary risks. Or conversely, it might be a tale of poking fun at those of us who feel like the tiny risks we take in life are Yeah, so, no, so now that you're, you're talking, you know, I get to look a little more closely. You know, when I first said that there are these two things that are just stuck together. I see that they're really not. They're, they're, they're entangled. And um, with the selfie, this is, I think, the funniest you've ever been. <laughs> Lillian gets funny because if, if the angel's taking a selfie. Yes, yes. The angels, now yes. they're in on it too. So um, in, in the tale of risk taking, what's really interesting to me, and you pointed it out a little bit um, earlier, is how um, the figures are, are the, the, there is this, this sort of dynamic relationship between the figures and the scaffolding so that there is this interaction and they seem to be sort of falling through each other. Mm -hmm. So was that, that is, is really a really fun element um, to that particular one. But um, I wonder if we, could, if we could look at another one. Um, Perhaps the, um, the the parable of the uh, parasol is that yes yes, yes. okay and it's a, it's a little quieter uh, the the central figure is um, uh, really you know taking up sort of this main space and it has a, a little more, more reverence to it um, so I would I would love to hear how that particular um, 
work came together and your choices there. Um, so talk, talk a little bit about this piece. So this one started with uh, this friend of mine. And when we did the improv, she says, can I bring a parasol? I'm like, absolutely, you can bring a parasol. And you used that parasol. And she did. I'm glad to know that next time I can bring props because I didn't <laughs> know that. I said, absolutely, you can. And she made good use of it. And I just, I was determined to use it somehow. Uh, and I, I thought a lot about what to call this one. And I finally thought, okay, it's Parable of the Parasol. And that leaves it wide open in my mind as to what the heck is the parasol, the parable all about. But that's up to you. Um, but one of the fun things about this, and, and a lot of it's in the details. For instance, if you look in the, uh, the far right-hand side, there's a little guy who's peeking out on the top, but if you look a little harder, you realize his feet are peeking out all the way at the bottom. Um, and then at the top, he's sitting there looking kind of aghast with this little, little monster growing out of a floral thing, telling him something. And then if you move over a little bit towards the center, you've got these two monsters that, after a while, to me, that looked like they were wearing baseball caps and fighting over a hamburger. <laughs> and then you move down, and you've got this uh, turkey creature that clearly belongs in the manuscript world, but he's come out of that world and he's perched on the shoulder of our main character, our protagonist, and he's going head to head with the largest dragon uh, in the image. Um, and then if you move down a little more, just this is the fun of the paint. You've got these fun, intricate patterns of flowers on her dress next to the geometric patterns on the manuscript. And then you move over a little bit and there's this you know, paint being paint where it's about, again, viscosity and pouring a couple of layers on and then just barely touching them and seeing what kinds of interesting things they'll do. Well, that and that's, that's um, always been a big thing in your work is, um, just the material, how you use the material, it's often incredibly sensuous and beautiful. And no matter what you're doing, that what's going on with the paint is really interesting. So you brought up a couple things that I want to talk about. Um, one is this um, idea of story or narrative, um, which really I think has been part of your work from the first, even, even the work without any any people in it, the, the um, the landscapes, the eerie landscapes without people, there's always to me a story there. But in your last show with um, Anya, um, you had introduced uh, the graphic novel sort of comic kind of situation, which is right behind you. So mm -hmm. we get, we get getting to see it. So, I mean, I'm, I am starting to see that there is, you know, there's a little bit of a progression here. Um, and you've given these, titles, you think about story, you think about narrative, you're, you're creating some kind of a whole. So um, maybe talk a little bit about um, that idea of story and how it has moved through your work um, as, as your work has taken this, this turn, which is, okay. I think, you know, it speaks to your older work and it also is pointing in another direction. Well, the, the, the storytelling, as you said, it, it's always been a part of the work, even when it was not quite so explicit. So you probably can't see it as well, but behind me on the other side um, is uh, what I say, classic weightscape. So it's people waiting, isolated from self, from others in this hermetically sealed bubble, uh, usually fiddling with some kind of gadget, uh, receding into empty space. But that empty space for me was always a symbolic space. It was not a literal place. So it spoke to metaphor, allegory of, of our personal isolation, of our, of our personal obsession with technology versus connecting with people. Uh, you know, it was very, you know, it's a, it's a story, an allegory, which is how I got into the whole thing of parables and allegories. So, at one point in time, those figures started to become a little more animated, interact with each other. And that obviously became much more narrative. The minute you have people interacting, we impose a narrative on it. We make up a story about it. And so as the work became more narrative, I started thinking, okay, what's a logical 
next step? What's a logical framework? And that's when I thought about the graphic novel because it is the contemporary narrative, visual narrative framework. And that's when I embedded the figures in the graphic novel, usually with um, that, that format, but usually it's very little text. And it's like you randomly found one page in a graphic novel. You have no idea what's going on, uh, but something's going on with these people. It's really important to them, but you don't know what it is. So a lot of ambiguity there. But the one thing that added, that I really liked about the graphic novel context was that graphic novels are normally about superheroes. Saving lives, saving the world, saving the universe. They're usually not about ordinary, everyday people doing tiny, mundane, microscopic things in daily life. So I felt like the context of the superhero graphic novel really added to that what's going on here and, and made it again a more symbolic space. And so as we've been talking about the, the medieval manuscripts, as you can tell, that is, was a, uh, it was the narrative visual language of its time. Um, insanely rich with detail. Um, the, the main characters were the superheroes, the saints and heroic figures of legend. Um, so that fit really well. But one of the things that the artists and the monks did that I just adored was the mixing of these big sacred stories that were you know, life affirming and life changing and told the people who they were with this insane nuttiness of monks drinking too much and snakes eating their tails and rabbits hunting lions and you know you, you name it <laughs> snails having back pitch battles with it, it makes you, shining armor. it makes you it makes you wonder like if it was probably a tedious job so they had to <laughs> keep themselves you, you kind of wonder if, if they were doing it to entertain themselves uh, but yeah but so to me it, it seemed like the perfect um armature because i've always seen life that way in that it's this wild mix of the big existential questions of life and death and happiness mixed in with absurd mundane foolishness um so it, it seemed to be a great mix of those two things not to mention the big mix across uh, uh, artistic tra uh, traditions so when i and i look at and then i think about the weightscapes um they had there was an austerity to them and i, I think all of us left the left the show going, we've got to put our phones down. <laughs> it seemed like I think she, Lillian is sending us a message. We're, we're not hanging out enough, you know, it, but it, it had, that white space was kind of, um, it, it, it had a kind of power to it. Um, and when I think about uh, this body of work, there, you know, there is no white space. <laughs> There's this, like you have filled every inch with this wildness. Um, and, uh, it, it's, you know, it, they're very dense. They're very dense. Um, they're like, they're the opposite of austere. <laughs> really, they yeah. are. There's yeah. so much going on, but that doesn't mean, um, that there isn't, um, a sense of depth to them. And maybe we should look at, um, dreams. Is it dreams? Dreams, dreams of, of self. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, again, it is, it is, um, uh, one of the images that is, it has a little bit uh, of uh, sort of a quiet to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's quite, uh, you know, it also has this little bit of reverence to it. So do you want to talk about how that, how those images, um, how, how you wanted to encapsulate this, yeah. this, this woman? Well, on this one, I started off with the, the main character, the, the gal in the orange pants who just seems so self-contained. Um, you, if you get up close, you can see she's got her hands just really tightly in her body language. And she's very, kind of like, leave me alone, very internally focused. And so, you know, I, I threw elements into that that either contrasted or made you think, well, what's going on psychologically? So at the top, you've got these two bovine creatures quite literally locking horns. So, you know, is she locking horns with herself with someone else? And then you move down a little bit and there's multiple images of her with her back turned to herself. So is that what's going on? And then you have these kind of nuns maybe 
angels. I don't know what they are on the sides with a big book saying, you know, basically it reads to me like, this is how you ought to behave. This is who you ought to be, you know? And then there's her with this halo made out of snakes and dragons. And she's on this very active kind of prickly intertwined background. And yet she's so self-composed and quiet. So this one, I really wanted to play with the visual contrast of, so what is her dream of self? And maybe make us think about our dreams of who we want to be or who we are. So it, it's clear to me that you, you put a lot of thought into um, which dragon goes where and what angel, is, you know. So did it take a while to sort of become fluent in the vocabulary of the Book of Kells? What was that like? I mean, it, it isn't like everyone reads that all day long. I mean, how did, no, you, no. How did you enter that visual imagination? Well, I, uh, I studied a master's program in art history low these many years ago, and it uh, focused in on medieval art. So I fell in love with the style and again, you know, the visual density and the symbolism and the craziness decades ago. I just never figured out quite how to, I've always actually for years, I've had the idea of this, and maybe I could sprinkle some of that in the artwork and I never could make it work. And that idea rolled around again. I thought, I'm going to try that again. <laughs> So it was just something waiting. It was lurking in the closet. I love that. The, the dragons closet. were in the closet and they then were. they just came they out. Were. And yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. that, is so, that is so interesting. Well, it, it looks to me like you became as fluent in that visual language as you are in um, the, the language of weightscapes and the landscape of Sort of human interaction, which you developed in in Anya's uh, the two shows you did at Anya's before. Um, why don't you uh, let us know how can we see the show? Give us more of the details. Um, uh, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows when to show up and what to see because it's it's okay. it's just such a great body of work. It's such a fun departure, and um, the the work is so rich and arresting and you could spend a lot of time looking at each one. So I want to congratulate you on this body of work. It's, I I'm, I'm feel very privileged to have seen it in, the, in its early stages. And, um, and it's so great that, that now everyone's going to see it and get, be able to get to the show. Thank you for, for all the kind words. I hope, you know, I want the work to both be lots of fun to look at. It was, it's great fun to paint, uh, but also hopefully thought provoking, you know, not just a one liner. Um, the show is currently up at Anya Tisch Gallery and will be up through October 31st. The gallery is uh, having hours. They're open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, noon to four. So grab your mask and come on over for a visit. Thank you.